Hi, and welcome back. So I'll begin this week with a question. What is American literature? So to answer that question, we first need to understand what America is. So today in the United States, America is most often used to speak just to the, to the US alone. So for example, Trump's campaign slogan, Make America Great Again, and his foreign trade policy, America First, uh, are meant to evoke only the 50 states and not one step beyond the US border. But as a point of fact, however, America actually comprises the totality of North America and South America. So from the northernmost point of Greenland, way up north, uh, to the southern, southernmost tip of Chile. So America then actually accounts for almost all of the land in the Western Hemisphere. So the earliest American literature, what we're reading for this week, really speaks to this broad international frame. American literature before 1700 was just as likely to be recorded in a, a variety of indigenous languages, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, as well as English. For example, Columbus's voyage letter uh, was originally written in Spanish and was translated then into English uh, for, for our reading for today. And the two Native American origin stories, um, one was, was spoken in Pima and then the other was spoken in uh, the Northern Iroquoian language. So uh, this international context is key to understanding the earliest American literature. So let's return to that question then of what is America? And I'm going to tell you a story that I think helps illuminate this, this question. So even the word America itself, the name of, of this continental landmass, is itself a kind of fiction. So you probably heard of Amerigo Vespucci in your middle school and high school history classes, um, and he's the guy um, who this landmass is named after. Um, he was an, an Italian navigator who worked for Spain in the 15th century. Interestingly, as a side job, he sometimes, sometimes sold pickles to sailors to keep them from getting scurvy on long voyages. He actually made quite a bit of money doing the, the pickle gig rather than, you know, kind of uh, the, the navigational gig. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this, this, this figure, Vespucci, is often credited with discovering the American continent. Um, but it's more likely that he just had a big mouth and a big imagination. So he claimed to have been to the New World at least five times. And while he did indeed sail to Brazil and he went to the West Indies as well, he did so over a decade after Columbus and thousands and thousands of years after Native American uh, tri or Na Na Native American people were, were living in complex societies on, on these spaces. So uh, the landmass that we're on right now bears this guy's name, a pickle salesman from Italy working for Spain. Um, but I think uh, this, this story itself is useful for us in this class. So um, the, the takeaway is an Italian guy working for Spain sailed to the New World and he told a story that enough people chose to believe. So not only does this reflect the international nature of America pre-1700, so he was kind of from all over Europe and explored, you know, kind of places throughout the, the American continent, um, but it also shows us, you know, kind of even more crucially, how powerful stories can be. So the, the literature part of American literature. So um, to, to keep thinking about this question, what is American literature? Um, let's, let's turn to our readings for this week. So what, uh, what's on the syllabus for this week can, can roughly be divided into two groups. So first, the literature of contact, and second, the literature of the colonies. So um, the literature of contact accounts for the Native American origin stories and the Christopher Columbus letter. And the second, the, the literature of the colonies, includes Winthrop, Bradstreet, Rowlandson, and Mather. So moving chronologically, let's talk about the literature of contact. Native American societies have long, dynamic, and complex histories. So this image here is an illustration from about 1585 in what is North Carolina. It's called Secotan Village, and even here you get a sense of what uh, civil Native American civilization looked like in, in some places. So here, um, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner of this illustration, uh, this, this bottom hut is uh, a tomb for important leaders. And then um, we see we see dining places here in 
uh, in the middle. Uh, this part, uh, letter B, is is marking a place that was supposed to be for solemn prayer. So here we can see like architecturally distinct spaces, a city that's mapped out in a really purposeful way that reflects a dynamic, organized, sophisticated culture. There's no way to truly do justice to the long, complex histories of Native American tribes before Columbus's arrival, but I will talk through some of the contexts from which our readings came from today. So Native American peoples range from the Iroquois Confederacy of Tribes to the Northeast, so that's here in upstate New York. The creation of folk stories, one of our readings for today, emerges from this tribe. To the Pima people of the Southwest, and the story of creation that we read for today came from came from uh, this this group here, um, and there are so many tribes as this map shows us uh, that that uh, existed between. So Native American peoples were divided among many tribes and bands. They spoke literally hundreds of mutually unintelligible languages and lived under a wide variety of political and social organizations. Some tribes subsisted by hunting, fishing, gathering nuts and seeds and berries, while many others were farmers living in villages and towns, especially in the Northeast and the Southeast. So that image I opened up with shows us uh, both agriculture and hunting in that society. Still others lived in urban centers in the middle of the continent, where the great Mississippian culture lasted for nearly 900 years as well as in the Southwest, where many tribes built complex cities and developed extensive irrigation systems for their crops. In contrast to Christianized Europe, a wide variety of religious and mythological beliefs flourished throughout the Americas. The primary vehicle for the preservation of culture was spoken language, through which poems, songs, and stories were passed down from generation to generation. Storytelling was a central feature of the communal life, a principal way in which Native American peoples provided entertainment, educated their young, and transmitted their traditions. European explorers and missionaries consequently tended to view Native American societies and religions as simple and unsophisticated. They also misunderstood the names of and distinctions among various tribes and groups. So for example, when the Spanish missionaries encountered tribes in the southern part of present-day Arizona, so they named the Pima, so the, the story of creation that we're reading, um, they, they named them a, corrupt, a, a corruption of the tribe's word for no. So the missionaries mistook no, so the, as, as the indigenous people were saying back to them, as the name of the tribe. Contact with European cultures was incredibly destructive for Native American cultures. So when making the effort to study and understand Native American oral literature, we must consequently accept the fact that the record is fragmentary and often problematic. So the following stories, the two that we've read, are intended as examples of the kinds of indigenous origin and creation stories that were part of the multiple cultures in existence at the time of the first explorations of what Europeans thought was the New World. Both of these stories offer at least a glimpse of the richness and complexity of the earliest literatures of North America. As you'll probably notice from Christopher Columbus's voyage letter from this week, this robust understanding of Native American cultures is completely lost on European explorers. So this is an image of Christopher Columbus, the man who is said to have discovered America. On August 3rd, 1492, Columbus set sail from Spain to find an all-water route to Asia. On October 12th, more than two months later, Columbus landed on an island in the Bahamas that he called San Salvador. So not the San Salvador that exists with us today, but one that he, that he named himself. Uh, for nearly five months, Columbus explored the Caribbean, particularly the islands of Cuba, Hispaniola, before returning to Spain. He left 39 men to build a settlement called La Navidad in present-day Haiti. He also kidnapped several Native Americans be between 10 and 25 to take back to Spain, and only eight survived the journey back. Columbus brought back small amounts of gold as well as native birds and plants to show the richness of the continent he believed to be Asia. In 1493, as soon as Columbus arrived back in Spain, he immediately wrote a letter announcing his discoveries to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. So this is the voyage letter. The letter was written in Spanish and sent to Rome, where it was printed in Latin. So that's what this, this image is here. 
The Latin printing of this letter announced the existence of the American continent throughout Europe. I discovered many islands inhabited by numerous people. I took possession of all of them for our most fortunate king by making public proclamation and unfurling his standard, no one making any resistance, Columbus wrote. So in addition to announcing his discovery, Colum and discovery in scare quotes here, Columbus's letter also provides observations of the native people's culture and lack of weapons, noting that, quote, they are destitute of arms which are entirely unknown to them and for which they are not adapted, not on account of any bodily deformity, for they were all well made, but because they are timid and full of terror, end quote. Writing that the narratives are f fearful and timid, guileless and honest, Columbus declares that the land could easily be conquered by Spain and that the natives might become Christians and inclined to love our king and queen and princes and all the people of Spain. So as you read, I want you to think about the contrast between Co Columbus's tone and his descriptions of, of America in contrast to the indigenous stories that we've read for today. So what do you make of his descriptions of, of the people who he encounters as timid and full of fear? Why did Columbus describe the islands and their inhabitants in great detail? So Columbus's voyage letter that you read for today was enormously popular in the, in the late 15th and early 16th century. It was reprinted again and again, and it was translated throughout Europe. What you're reading for this week sparked the imagination of a lot of Europeans about the bounty the New World had to offer. So I want you to think about it as a rhetorical document. Columbus was trying to convince European leaders uh, that the New World was a place that we should all be. Um, there are abundant resources and people there who, um, who can easily be enslaved, who can easily work to help uh, Europeans extract resources from the New World. Um, but Columbus wasn't alone in, in his efforts. Um, he was part of a broader European movement uh, to explore and exploit the Americas. So the Dutch set up a colony in, in what is now New York City. The Spanish set up many colonies in, in the Caribbean, Central South America. The British had colonies in Virginia and Massachusetts. As a final note to this literature of contact, uh, Native American cultures were devastated by, by this contact with European explorers. So through this encounter, um, they, they encountered diseases which they had no immunity, um, as well as large-scale enslavement and slaughter by Europeans. The Na Native American population decreased dramatically, leaving in some places only a handful of people in what had been robust and very populous tribes. Um, and, and because of that, because of this contact, the history, names, and ancient cultures of Native America that predate Columbus's arrival are really lost to us. So those stories that populated uh, the Native American content before 1492 um, only exist for us in fragments. So keep that in mind as you're, as you're reading the Native American origin stories, and keep in mind that building American literature is just as much, much about what's erased, what's lost, um, as what we remember. So now we're jumping forward in time by about 150 years to the, to the literature of the colonies and more particularly the literature of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which was a, a British colony. So in the early 17th century, around 1620s, a very zealous and extreme religious group who are known as the Puritans established a colony in Massachusetts Bay. They were facing persecution in England and they were looking for a way out. And thanks to the legacy of explorers and exploiters like Christopher Columbus, they turned to the new world as a place for a new beginning. So as a point of transition from the literature of contact that we've been discussing uh, to this literature of the colonies, I want us to take a look at uh, the crest of the Massachusetts Bay Company. Here is the crest of the Massachusetts Bay Company. So as you see here, we have a Native American standing in the middle of the crest, holding a bow and arrow, um, and it's surrounded by, uh, so this is, this is the date that it was founded, uh, the Society of the Massachusetts Bay in New England. So interestingly, coming out of the mouth of this Native American is, is the cry, come over and help us. So given the longer context of exploration and exploitation in which Native Americans were greatly harmed by British culture, um, this, is, this is pretty rich. But I think it speaks to the way that the, the Puritans of Massachusetts Bay imagined themselves. So um, first, uh, they saw themselves as different from the Spanish. 
So in the 150 years that we've skipped over, uh, there was a growing force of what's called the Black Legend, in which the British colonizers used the brutality of the Spanish, um, who'd been colonizing the American continent before, to justify their own exploitation of, of the Americas. So basically they were saying, hey, at least we're not so bad as the Spanish. We might be here, we might be establishing colonies, but we're not, we're not doing, we're not as harmful as the Spanish have been. So um, the Massachusetts Bay Company saw themselves in contrast to the Spanish. And moreover, they, they saw part of their mission as Christianizing the Native Americans who, who lived on the American continent. So our four remaining authors of this week, John Winthrop, Anne Bradstreet, Mary Rowlandson, and Cotton Mather, well, we're all part of the Massachusetts Bay Company. So from their poetry, from their essays, from Mary Rowlandson's uh, narrative account, um, we can learn a lot about what life was actually like for these people. So I'll, f I'll start off first by talking about John Winthrop. Um, so we're reading a small section of a model of Christian charity. So this is from a much lar larger piece. Um, but John Winthrop, it's a key to know that he was one of the first governors of the Massachusetts Bay Company. And this model of Christian charity is him setting up a model for what the new society should be. So I want you to ask yourself, what does, what does Winthrop want this new society to look like? Um, what does he mean about the rich and the poor that we get at the very beginning? Um, and what does he understand to be people's Christian duty to one another? So then moving on to Anne Bradstreet, who actually sailed to the New World with John Winthrop. So she was on board the same ship uh, with Winthrop, who wrote the model of Christian charity, so they would have known each other. Bradstreet gives us some of our first poems written in English on the American continent. Um, and interestingly for us at Merrimack, she lived basically on campus. So where you are if you're on campus is, where, ex is exactly where Anne Bradstreet was when she was writing. So you might keep that in mind when she's describing the environment. It's the environment that's around you. So more than any of these other writers, Anne Bradstreet is, is our poet. Um, and when you're reading her poetry, I want you to think about uh, what, what she's suggesting about authorship, what it's like for a woman to write a book of poetry, especially given that Anne Bradstreet is America's first poet. So then moving to Mary Rowlandson's narrative, uh, we get a really marked contrast from the tone and the content of Anne Bradstreet's poetry. Mary Rowlandson's narrative was a bestseller as soon, it was, as soon as it was written and printed. It's something that people have continued to read for a long time. So when you're reading Rowlandson, I want you to think about the Christianity that she gives us here and how it might relate to what John Winthrop's model is. So Winthrop's give, giving us a model of a Christian society. And then what does, what does Rowlandson give us? And again, think about her role as a woman in Massachusetts in the 17th century. And that leaves our last writer, we have Cotton Mather, who um, in The Wonders of the Invisible World is giving us a firsthand account of what it was like to live through the Salem witch trials. So this is, um, so Winthrop, Bradstreet, and Rowlandson come first, and then we have Cotton Mather who's writing about the Salem witch trials that happened at the very end of the 17th century. Um, so in, in his text, he is, um, I want you to think about uh, his, his stance on witchcraft. Does he think this is real? Is he justifying the treatment of the people who are, who are prosecuted for being witches? Or is it, or is it a, a more nuanced stance? So I moved through the Puritans really quickly, but if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts that you want to share with the group, please put it on our Google Classroom page. But otherwise, enjoy the readings. Think about these authors as part of a very international context uh, that, that was America before 1700. Uh, next week, we'll move into the 18th century where things um, start looking a little bit different. Also, our texts get easier to read as we move forward. The 18th and 19th century are easier to read than the, the 17th century texts. Um, the English can be really distant and difficult, so hang in there just a little bit longer and things will get a little bit more interesting, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more familiar to, to what we imagine to be literature today. Um, but all along the way, every 100 years, we'll keep asking, what is American literature? And we'll think uh, both about what we're reading, why that fits into this canon, um, and then what, and we'll try to imagine what gets left out as well. So again, uh, thinking about how we, how we create this canon and how each of these texts help tell the story of who we are.